Welcome to the comic book story for the Days of Future Past. This is one of the most important storylines in the history of the X-Men and has actually been rated as one of the best comics in history on multiple lists. Interesting note though, while there are a lot of lead up issues to it, the actual Days of Future Past is only a two issue arc that happened in the 80s. Now, it does introduce the future X-Men and they do become a reoccurring theme, but I personally find it interesting that in a day and age when we have story arcs that span 6 to 12 months, we had one of the best comic arcs spanning only two issues. Now today's question is easy. Do you enjoy the reimagining they're doing for this movie? The biggest of which is removing Kitty Pryde from the lead of the story, as I'm about to explain to you. Now things begin in the 21st century where New York is a nightmare city run by the Sentinels. Mutants are either slaves or they're killed. The X-Men are no longer a team and the government is one. In this destroyed future, mutants are regulated to concentration camps and the government run Sentinels keep tabs on them. The city is also filled with power dampeners which prevent the mutants from even using their powers. Things are just bad for the mutants. But our story begins with Kitty Pride as she's trying to deliver medical supplies when she gets cornered by some humans who are against mutants in general and for what their existence has brought to this world. She probably would be in a much worse state, but it's Wolverine who jumps in to save the day. Now, sadly, he didn't just jump in to save her. He's here to warn her. You see, He's joined the Canadian resistance against the Sentinels, and they're currently planning to launch a full-scale nuclear assault on America to stop these Sentinels. Kitty Pride realizes that they have to try something. Something extreme. Something crazy. Something that the entire future will rely on to save everybody. When she gets back to the last remaining X-Men, we see that only Colossus, Storm, Rachel Summers, Franklin Richards, and Magneto are left. And Magneto is now restricted to a wheelchair. Rather ironic. Their plan is desperate, but they intend to use Rachel Summers' powers to send Kitty Pride's mind back in time. Their last hope is that she can warn everybody and stop this future from even ever happening. We then travel to October 30th, 1980, and the first day that Kitty Pride is joining the X-Men. On her first day in the school, she ends up fainting in the danger room after showing off her powers. And when she awakes, her brain waves are all different. That's because the Kitty Pride from the future is in her younger body. The first thing she does is exclaim how happy she is to see all of the X-Men actually still alive. And then she explains that she's from 30 years from now. The world goes to hell after the Brotherhood of Mutants assassinates Senator Robert Kelly, Professor X, and Moira McTaggart while they're at a hearing about the possible dangers of mutants. These assassinations will bring the anti-mutant hysteria, and by 1984, an anti-mutant president will be in office. He will start the Mutant Control Act, and this will bring on the Sentinels to protect humanity from the mutants but eventually the Sentinels would enslave all of the United States. She was the one sent back to her first day because she was the only one without any kind of psychic protection from Professor X at this time. And if she fails, the future will not only not happen, but they will eventually lose that crappy future also because of the nuclear blast coming to the States. Meanwhile, back in the future, Rachel Summers, Franklin Richards, and Colossus all end up having to escape the concentration camp, and they're doing it while carrying Kitty Pride's body but they only managed to get away because Magneto sacrificed himself for them. They then meet up with Wolverine, and all of them begin to head to the Sentinel's base of operations, the Baxter Building. They figure that if Kitty Pride fails, they need to do something to stop the Sentinels before the nuclear blast actually happens. They choose to move through the sewers, but the Sentinels end up finding them and killing Franklin Richards. The rest of them manage to kill off the Sentinels, and they continue towards the old Fantastic Four building. Back in the present, the X-Men are arriving at the hearing in their civilian clothes. But just as Professor X is asking telepathically what's going on, the Brotherhood of Mutants breaks down the door and they attack Senator Kelly. The X-Men change quickly and they go save Senator Kelly. But a security guard leads Professor X and Moria away and then he gasses them. The guard is actually Mystique in disguise and she takes them as hostages. Back in the future, the X-Men manage to get to the Baxter building. But while Rachel Summers stay behind to watch over Kitty Pryde's body, Storm, Colossus, and Wolverine go inside. They ride the elevator to the top, preparing for the biggest and most important fight of their entire lives. Back in 1980, the Brotherhood and the X-Men continue to fight in the Senator's office. Storm then uses her powers to blow them out the doors, and the fighting continues out in the open. But things get a tad bit trickier, as the National Guard is now arriving to put an end to all of this. The fights continue until ultimately the X-Men win. But once they finally finish up the fight, and they rescue Professor X and Moira, they begin to realize how confusing that large battle actually was, and they realize that they've lost track of Destiny and Kitty Pride. Where are they? Back in the future, the X-Men walk out of the elevator and onto the top floor of the Baxter building. Here they look around and they see one Sentinel working on the main computers. 
Before the Sentinel could read what they're doing, Wolverine tells Colossus to launch him at the thing using the fastball special. The problem is, the Sentinel actually does detect them and blasts Wolverine down to nothing but his skeleton. Storm becomes enraged and she chooses to get her revenge on that Sentinel. But just as they defeat him, more Sentinels arrive and they kill both Storm and Colossus. Down below, Rachel Summers hears her friends dying and she cries hoping that Kitty Pride will be successful from stopping this from ever happening. Because they have no hope left in the future. There's no way to stop the Sentinels and prevent the nuclear blast. Back in 1980, Destiny has Senator Kelly cornered, but what she doesn't know is that Kitty Pryde has followed her and is also in this room. Destiny starts lining up the shot that will make history, the shot that will change everything, the shot that will bring the Sentinels and cause the end of the world eventually. But just before she can take it, Kitty Pryde passes through her body, throwing off her aim, and Destiny completely misses Senator Kelly. That was all it took, the change that changes everything, and sends Kitty Pryde's future mind back to the future. The 1980s mind of Kitty Pride passes out from the strain. Destiny gets arrested, and everyone goes on to Warren's jet to return back to the X-Men mansion. Professor X then checks and sees not a single sign of the future Kitty Pride. And when asked if they managed to save the future, he simply tells them, they did manage to change the future, but if it was for the better, only time will tell. Well, that's it. The Days of Future Past two-issue comic arc. If you've learned something new or heard this story for the first time, make sure you give this video a like as it really helps us decide where to bring these videos. And if we got something horribly, horribly wrong with this story, let us know in the comments down below. I read this story off the trade paperback and there was a lot of bonus issues in there that didn't seem to actually pertain to the actual story, which made it a tad bit confusing. So let me know what we might have missed. Other than that, I'll see you guys next time here at Comic Comicstorian.